sort of the signal from the from the figures was people are short they know they're short but there's a small bit of how would you say wait and see type thinking uh, in 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 the mix which can be worrying enough i would say you know i, th- I think it's better to, for people to start planning a little bit further and and thinking okay take some action or take an action that can help to um to close the gap sooner rather than later hello i'm james dunn and you're welcome to the dairy edge the chagas dairy podcast we're bringing you the latest information insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance given the extended winter at the start of the year and below average growth rates for 2024 to date, farmers must give priority to ensure that they have enough fodder stocks heading into the house period later in the year. I'm joined by Joe Patton, head of Chagas Dairy KT, to discuss the recent fodder survey and what options are available for farmers. Thanks for joining us, Joe. So I suppose maybe to get straight into it, I see there was a a national fodder survey completed uh, recently. what exactly is the is the results of that telling us? Yeah, it's James. Uh, it's probably telling us what we a lot of farms could tell us already, or we're feeling already, is that in a broad sense that the the countries a wee bit on the tight side are certainly being at risk of being tight, James. So, like the ballpark numbers on that really look that on average, um, dairy farms are sitting at about sixty percent of their winter feed secured uh, after first cut. On the dry stock side, that's more like 64, 65%. Okay. So look at relative to the target, you would rather see the dairy being that closer to 70 or above it. And you'd like to see the, the dry stock at 80 or thereabouts. So really, farms are sort of somewhere between 10 and 15% back from where they should be after first cut. Now you'd expect obviously second cut will close the gap. Maybe second cuts aren't uh, yielding, given the poor growth conditions in a lot of places. Maybe there's um, there's some expectation that you know second cut yields will probably only be normal or less than normal. They're not going to be bumper crops, so that would suggest that there is, you know, we're early yet talking about this, but there's definitely evidence of um, an emerging shortage. We would say. And from within that, then are you seeing regional differences, Joe, or is that we'll say countrywide? Um. We're not seeing huge regional differences, I would say, of all the it's pretty pretty consistent on the dairy side, I would say, James, across the board. We're pretty much if you look at the east, um, it's about sixty percent, the Midlands is fifty-eight percent, the southwest um closer to sixty percent, and the northwest is about the same. So it's very, very consistent on the dairy side. The one area actually where there seems to be its closest to target would be dry stock farms in the west and the north of the country, which might surprise people, but they're the ones that are closest to target. So look at, um, and I mean, we, we have to be clear too that we like we do this survey, or this we do this kind of survey, or this work every year, uh, which is a good thing to do to give us baseline figures for what a normal year should look like. So really, since 2018, the, the fi- figures on the survey have always been in and around that 70% or 70 plus at this point of the year for dairy farms. The fact that it's only at 60 this year is, is what's probably um, making us, you know, I'm not saying alarm bells at this stage, but certainly make us sit up and and take notice that we do need to be careful and keep a watching eye on it, particularly um, given that second cuts aren't, you know, aren't probably where they need to be. Now, we will obviously come back and do uh, a repeat survey maybe in September when second cuts are in. But for the moment, I would say that the the, the basic message is that there, there is work to do on average on farms to to make sure that we are we're in a good position from September, October onwards. Just one bit, maybe we'll take that now. That that is cropping up. Some second cuts are, are maybe already harvested or definitely um in the next week or so will be harvested. They seem to be lighter than people would like, and sure that's um understandable given where the growth rates are at. What should farmers do in that situation then, Joe? Should they, should they cut and, and maybe think about going again on outside blocks? Should they let it run a little bit? What's what's the advice around that? That's It's it's a tricky one until you see the individual farm circumstances, James. I suppose for people maybe that have, um, you know, some of their second cut that's sitting on the grazing block, for example, you would like to start seeing that coming back in uh, as, a, you know, being available, let's say, to start building covers through August. So certainly the... Um, the, the idea would be to maybe move sooner rather than later on that, that it's back in play. 
you know, you can always take surpluses again if they arise, if you go too far. But certainly if it's if you're planning on being grazing it and using it to build cover, you'd like to see it gone. Maybe on some areas of the farm, if it's particularly backward and it's on an out farm where, you know, the choice is to just let it sit there and bulk. That's possibly, you know, in, in some areas of the farm, that's possibly possibly OK. But more or less, you know, generally speaking, we do always say this, that it's probably always better to go and um, have the option of taking a, a third cut or an extra grazing if possible. Because you do see it over the years that, you know, leaving it sit there and letting it work out, particularly if it has had its nitrogen a long time and all the rest of it, it may just be sitting there. So maybe reset, you know, cut, reset um reapply nitrogen and, and and slurry possibly and 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 go again might be you might actually you might end up with more feed off the area uh, as a whole by doing it that way i would say hmm. from within that um survey then you would have asked farmers their plans in terms of what they plan to do to maybe close that gap what was kind of cropping up there well two things there um the first thing was really and this is where we'd be just you know a little bit concerned that you know, on the dairy side, you know, of the farms that have been I, I, that identified themselves as being short, and and they've also said that they don't think that second cut is going to close the gap. James, fifty mm. percent of people in that uh, c- category have no plan to do much at the moment. Uh, they haven't made any extra provision, which is a bit worrying, right? That figure is more like two thirds on the dry stock side. So look, it's it's early yet, obviously. Like, I mean, these results are a couple of weeks old at this stage. So, you know, it is, we have to remember that. But at that point in time, the idea was that, or the sort of the signal from the from the figures was people are short, they know they're short, but there's a small bit of, how would you say, wait and see type thinking in, in, in the mix, which can be worrying enough, I would say, you know, I, th- I think it's better to, for people to start planning a little bit further and and thinking, OK, take some action or take an action that can help to um to close the gap sooner rather than later. And like we did ask for people that if they have implemented any options, like what is it going to be like five or six percent are talking about forage crops, maybe 10 percent are talking about maize or whole crop. Most people are talking about rent and you know, or not renting, but certainly bringing more ground in, more grass ground into the mix. So maybe either buying silage or buying bales from neighbours or bringing extra ground in uh, for a cut. Now that was the that was what the talk was. But like as we know, that's getting it's getting late for that now, really. You know, because that's what's that? You know, that if that land is not under your control at this stage, um, it could be difficult enough to get much of a yield off it. So certainly, we should be saying that people need probably to be looking at making decisions within their own land base at the moment, which is how can you increase um, supply of feed and how, or maybe importantly also, how can you reduce demand at key times to maybe close the gap that little bit? Yeah, and we might come on to some of those priority actions. One other question on it, um, and I know it came up in the survey was, cash flow and cash flow management because it's been it's been look at it's been a challenge in 12 months at this stage um and you know cash maybe isn't as plentiful as we would like on farms no. any comment or just what should farmers maybe be doing because if, if if there is fodder to be bought it has to be bought and paid for joe which maybe wasn't factored in earlier in the year 100 percent. and like, look at i suppose when you pick through the numbers and averages can hide a lot of things james but there was definitely when we were looking through the numbers and we didn't present present it in this way on the days of the, the, the committee, but there is a fair degree of crossover between the farms that are saying that they haven't done anything yet and farms that are saying they're going to have a cash flow issue. So like I fully take the point. It's OK for me to be saying, you know, from where we're sitting, you need to go and do something. But going and doing something, if, if it means putting extra feed in the yard or on the farm, that's that has cash implications, obviously. And maybe cash is the thing that's, you know, limiting people from going and do something, you know, and that's a worry. Like that is certainly a worry that we have to. So part of the planning for um for closing the gap on feed has to take the cash flow implications into account. About 38 percent of dairy farms that responded and about 30 percent of dry stock farms actually said they would have seen or expected a cash flow issue to arise uh, from the feed situation. So, you know, it's. It, you know when you when you, 
sometimes we undervalue the silage in, in our own yard, James. I suppose when you start to think about having to go out and replace it or buy it or fill up a gap, then the true value of the feed reserve is really shown in cash terms. You know, it is the old saying is true. It is money in the bank. Like, and um, we would just encourage people if they're feeling that bit, if the, if the concern is there that, you know, I know I need to do something, but I'm not sure how I'm going to do it because from a cash perspective, you know, come and talk to us and we'll try and, you know, work through it. And sometimes, sometimes addressing the demand side of the equation on farms like that might be, might be something that could be more useful in the short term. So if there's very lowly or poorly productive stock in the place, for example, and you're short for cash, you have to ask the question, which is the lesser of two evils, really? Which which side of the equation should you address? And oftentimes demand is where we should be we'd be looking at. So what you're saying there is some farmers that find themselves in a in a fodder deficit should be looking at considering um selling some surplus stock or culls now. Yeah, yeah, but look at I think that goes for all farms, not just farms and, f- and not just farms that are in a cash flow bind. You know, it should be always looked at that the economics of it are going to be similar whether you're short of cash or not. It's the value of retaining the animal versus the cost of buying the feed. To, you know, it's the value of what they're going to give you by retaining them versus the cost of the feed you have to buy to keep them. And we'll say if they're normally sold out in we'll say November, mid November, Joe, the difference in selling them now in early August. Yeah, but sure, look, you have, you, you may say that cows are eating, you know, a mature animal, no matter what they're doing, they're, they're doing 15, 16 kilos of dry matter per day, James, you know. Um, and that a ton a month, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And that's, I suppose, it's easy to forget that, that, you know, they're eat they're, it's, you know, if you're, if you're, blo- if you're cutting the feed out of the pit face and putting it in front of them, you'd see what they're eating a bit easier, if you know what I mean. It's just, it's a funny one on grass. You'd wonder how much you would save, but... Any farms we've talked to, speaking to a few there lately that, you know, the trimmed out and I'm not, we have to be clear here. This is a tactical, this is a tactical decision, right? It's not a decision to say we're reducing our overall herd size or anything like it. It's really about taking the decision to cull animals that you have already decided you're going to cull, but just culling them that bit earlier. Okay. And that's important. We make that distinction. The whole question about, optimum numbers and all the rest of it that's a di- that's for another day really this is about the decision you have to make and when do you make it um so look there'll be significant saving now we have spoken to farms that have done that and you'd be amazed at the difference it would make getting rid of those four or five um you know poorly productive animals the bull tank probably doesn't move in most cases but the feed demand changes a little bit and it will all add up at the end of the season for sure now yeah. other options then in terms of there's there's still a certain level of the growing season. Where are we at with regards to nitrogen usage or nitrogen nitrogen allowance on farms? Yeah, look, the nitrogen allowance is one the tricky one with the nitrogen allowance, it does tend to vary from farm to farm, and that's depending on where you're at with your overall organic end rates. But I suppose some relatively relatively positive news in that regard this week that um you know the 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 Department of Agriculture did announce that that the, the proposed changes to the nitrogen limit, so the proposed um five percent reduction in nitrogen limits, has been you know that's off the shelf basically. It's off. It's 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 not it's not in play for for this year. So you know for a lot of farms maybe farming at the upper end of the stocking rate, the, the idea was this year that would they would have to drop from two twenty five kilos back to two twelve right. So there's twelve roughly twelve kilos of of nitrogen per hectare. Uh, was the proposal and that was assumed to be coming true but that's not going to come true now so basically what we're saying is there's 12 kilos per hectare more available to farmers in nitrogen terms than than what the plans would have originally said for the start of the year okay now i know 12 kilos per hectare doesn't sound like a whole pile if you're facing you know the way things are at the moment but at the same time you know, 12 kilos per hectare is a nice little bit extra. It's it's you know, it's half a round again of nitrogen for the for the for the grazing block. Or indeed, if somebody wanted to be going and making a third cut, it's enough to put out enough fertilizer for a third cut on about 20% of your land area. So it's quite significant at this stage of the year, you know, because you've a lot of the year behind you at this point. So look what I would be saying, one clear message really would be just go back and look establish what nitrogen is available i'd say if some farms looking at some data from pasture base there's a, some farms are maybe 20 15 20 behind where they would have 
normally be for this time of the year based on maybe struggling to get nitrogen out in the spring. So if you added maybe 10% that you're behind anyway, plus another 10 or 12 kilos that um, is available that you didn't think would be, suddenly there might be a little bit of nitrogen spare in the system that could help, as I say, either build a bit of a third cut or indeed get your grazing block moving a little bit further for the back end of the of the summer. OK, but again, there's no change in dates or there'll be no extension to, to dates or timing of nitrogen. The only thing is there's basically there's a, enough night. It'll be the same nitrogen as was available last year. And you just have to check and make sure that you've used your allowance and used it wisely. When we are on nitrogen, there's been lower growth rates, obviously, than people would like over the over the yeah. summer period. And something that it seems to be an age old thing now, and it's cropping up a bit. Um, and maybe it's a confidence thing, just the way the year has went. But that question is protected urea delivering the same level of growth, we'll say, as other other nitrogen sources. Still does crop up, Joe. It does. Um, it do- It it crops up. It's definitely something that we're hearing. Anecdotally, um, it, it's something that tends to spread through a group when the discussion has been had, uh, James, to be fair. But um, look, I think we have to be very careful on that and say, you know, I don't I'm not being flippant on this, but I mean, based on what numbers or what evidence is this being said? Right. Like we, we, we do have a lot of anecdotal stuff being talked about uh, this. Well, I changed and I it got a better response or I got this or I got that. But there has been week to week variation in gra- grass growth anyway. Some a couple of weeks ago, grass growth came up and went back down again there. So depending on where you are in the country and the rainfall and all the rest of it, it's been a weird year. Like, I mean, go and look at the med air and data from from Moor Park, from Ballyhays, from Johnstown and from Gorchin. I looked at those there lately. You know, the, the rainfall in, in June, even though it was cold, June and July, the rainfall is significantly behind uh, the long term average. So even though it's kind of you, 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 the perce- it's not perception that it's been a dry year, but actually it's dry enough year, not 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 hot enough to be a sort of a drought type of conditions. But growth rate is being checked by the weather conditions. Like there's no doubt about that. Um, and like. The only way to really know what's happening with with nitrogen and nitrogen source is to have repeated applications at the same rate on the same site over a period of time and measure the difference, right? Unless there's a control like that, you can't really be saying whether it's up or down based on the nitrogen type. And like we we've seen this and you know definitively and conclusively across lots of sites, um, over numbers of years. That the the protected urea versus can story urea delivers the same growth if not slightly higher than can over that over that period of time and that hasn't changed this year. We are seeing a weather effect and possibly some farms this year have been trying protected urea for good reason and fair play for for it. They've been trying protected urea this year and maybe because of the year that it's coincidental with a bad grass growth year, it might feel like that it's not working. Right now, I was looking there the other evening at uh, a farm that's um farm in the northeast that has used protected urea over a number of years at this stage. Last year, up to this point last year, they had grown 7.3 tons dry matter. This year, they have grown 6.1. So there's about 1.1, 1.2 difference in, in tons difference. Right. They've used protected urea in both of those years. Right. So there's no difference in fertilizer type, no real difference in fertilizer rate, yet there's over a ton difference in dry matter production. So are we saying that protected urea worked last year but didn't work this year? I don't think so. And the final point, and the one thing I would add to that is, you know, lots of farms are still using can this year, okay, and still continue to use can for their own reasons. Are we seeing um, a massive growth rate on the farms using can? I don't think we are. You know, if it was a if it was a fertilizer type question, we should be able to drive through the countryside and say, oh, there's a farm using can. That one's using urea. That one's using can because there'd be a big difference in growth rate. We're not seeing that. So I don't buy it. And, there, and it's not that I don't buy it. It's that the data does not support it in any way. I think we have to be careful on the hearsay. And, you know, I would be thinking we just have to we have to we have to look at the numbers and see that the numbers are telling us that it's a weather effect. Really, it's still a big effect, but. Don't be blaming the wrong thing for the issues that's happening at the moment. Very good. One other thing that is upon us, it's not very far away, is that, and you mentioned it, 
I'm building cover and we we're heading for August and um to talk about building cover and extended extending the grazing season, which is is always important, but we always seem to miss the targets. It's maybe more important this year than ever, given the fact uh, the winter feed supply. But it's a challenge in one, Joe, in the fact that really to do that, we have to do something either, you know, drop demand. And the question that is popping up is some, some people often fed silage, um, high quality silage maybe for a couple of weeks. Um, that isn't a live option on a lot of farms. So no. what should people be looking at this year in terms of trying to ensure that they do build farm cover? It's a it's a tricky one, James. Now, like we, you say that we in recent years we've been struggling to meet to to build cover. That is true, right? But why did we why did we manage to do it years ago and not do it in the recent years? What like, what is the reason for that? So the, what are we talking about here is why do why do we end up in the situation where maybe 10, 15 years ago farms man more farms tended to reach the average farm cover target in September? And maybe some farms are struggling a bit more to reach those targets at the moment. Like, what's the bit? What's the difference really for those farms? And a lot of the difference is probably down to the is down to 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 grazing stock on it. I would say. So years ago, when your second cut was taken, and your second cut area came into the mix, it was you, you almost got there by accident. Like I think people built cover years ago. On some farms, it was very much planned, but on other farms, it just happened by default, James, because there was extra ground that came into the mix. Would that be fair? Now, now this year, now in this stage, if you don't have much gra- grazing ground to come back in, or maybe this, the farm is stocked at over three livestock units per hectare, there isn't much. You know, the option of bringing in extra feed from bringing in extra silage ground doesn't happen to the same extent. Makes it much harder to build cover, and that means having to go and do something about it, as in supplement a bit extra in, in August, I suppose, to try and drive it on. I do think that there are stocking rates, there's a certain level of stocking rate at which building cover becomes very, very difficult indeed. You know, you're really into a situation where you have to almost accept that you're not going to get to the high stocking rate. You're not going to get to the high average farm cover in September. And the, the consequence of that is that you're going to be in the shed from October onwards, right? And that's the that is a consequence of the high stock and rate. Not much can be done about that. But in the middle range, there is uh, there are options there, I suppose, to try and 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 do something. An additional feed, like if we are talking about putting in additional supplements, unless we get an extension in rotation length. I think the danger is always there that we will waste that feed. Okay, we won't get a, a, an effect of supplement. So, for example, rotation length at the moment is probably sitting 20, 21 days. By the time you get to mid-August, you'd like to see that more like 25, 26, 27 days. You know, adding, you know, adding five to seven days onto the rotation. And then maybe for September, it's up to 30-day rotation. So in order to achieve that, we have to actually offer less area per day on the farm and make up the difference in supplement. Now that can be from high fiber concentrate from a bit of silage, um, whatever it needs to be to get to feed the herd within that, within that smaller area allocation of area. Um, assuming that you don't have extra area to bring in. So that can be tricky. And I can understand why, you know, in, in, in August when maybe it's a quieter time on farm, it's difficult to get your head around the idea of feeding more when, there is plenty of grass on the farm, probably, but feeding more in good conditions to have to have grass for later in the year. But it does pay off, I think, in the longer run in order to extend the, the rotation. So, look, I would say the easiest thing to do for the moment is look at it on the basis of rotation length. Target a, target a rotation length of maybe in mid-August of about 25, 26 days and maybe closer to 30 days by the end of, by the end of August, early September. And you're looking at filling in the gaps then with extra feed Um to make up the difference then it's you know but i would say to be fair and take the point that when you get to very high levels of stocking rate it can be very difficult to achieve that because the let the amount of feed extra that has to go in is is quite significant and you'll struggle to you'll struggle to extend the rotation anyway i would say so yeah maybe just one final question joe once it's something that crops up at farm level is um the idea in terms of stretching fodder reserves yeah What's your advice around that and, and how much long fibre would you say or what percentage of actual winter feed do we need in the in, within the farm gate before we maybe start considering that as a, as, as a real live option? 
Well, look, you will be certainly trying to get towards 80% plus, James. And I, I think we need to be just careful here around somebody. You know, I don't think we should be looking about going into the winter and saying, well, I'm going to stretch with concentrate, even though like the, the ambition or the, the objective at the moment should be to close as much of the gap as possible from long forage, right? A couple of reasons for that. First of all, the, possibly we're looking at in a dairy context, we're looking at, you know, dry cows that the the the, the additional feed is probably going to be dry cow feed and we'll be keeping our higher quality feed for the milk and herd. It's amazing what you can get away with. I don't mean that it's, you know, forage quality for dry for dry cows in good condition can be ordinary enough and you can still get through the winter, if you know what I mean. So you can get away with relatively cheap sources. So uh, the ambition should be to try and put as much of that away for the dry cow as possible at the moment. The second thing I would say is that experience shows us that in yards that are, you know, you know, in in, in most in most yards, the extra work required to put extra concentrate in front of cows during the winter period, particularly dry cows, is very significant. You know, it's much easier to feed a few extra purchased bales than it is to feed two to three kilos of a concentrate mix per cow and have the feed space and head space for them all in the month of December. So I think for the labour reasons even alone, closing the gap earlier is is important. The peace of mind is another element of that too, that, that you feel that you're heading into the winter with decent reserves in place. On a, at a minimum scale, look at, depending on the quality of the forage and all the rest of it, you would in theory at least get away with, let's say, 10, 11 kilos dry matter per cow, which could be down as low as seven kilos dry matter of of fresh forage, um, of fibrous forage, let's say, seven to eight kilos, something like that. But as I say, I wouldn't like to be heading into the winter with only a budget of seven kilos per cow per day in the yard for the entire winter period. Experience tells us that people move through that forage quicker than they plan. And if you don't have a good way of restricting the forage, the cow will not restrict herself But if you feed her concentrate. You will end up feeding concentrate and not saving much forage. And then you end up with two problems rather than one, over fat cows and also no silage anyway in, in the month of February. So look at, while we'd say 80% is the minimum you'd be looking to get to, we should be trying to push on past that uh, in the next in the next couple of weeks and months. You know, and we often say this, that a, uh, a 15 or 20 percent shortage in in um, feed at the start of the winter will be a 100 percent shortage next February and March. And we certainly don't want that. OK, so I think that's um, I think we we'll leave it at that. Uh, really, the message is, I suppose, everyone assess their own situation. Joe, get a budget done, see where you're at. And you've mentioned the actions there in terms of closing that gap over yeah. the coming months. And, and yeah. we but look at it, I, I just just up with you again. Yeah, but I just say, James, like, I mean, we're at least we're early talking about this. Do you know what I mean? It's it's still only July and we're this is a problem that will be manifest next February. And I hope that by next February, we're saying that was, you know, there was no there was no need to be talking about it because that proves that the situation was was resolved. It's early yet. There's plenty of options for people to to take, but we just need to make sure that people take some action or take some option. Right. And. It's been a tough old year for it's been a tough old year for 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 you know dairy farmers for dry stock and tillage farmers the whole lot has been so and it's really a weather it's a weather and a growth rate effect is what it is so look at a bit of extra planning have a chat about it talk to your group talk to your advisor do your bit of do your simple sums and see where you're fixed and I think even that alone is a great start do you know what I mean and come and talk to us and we'll try and we'll try and do something around getting some numbers on the page but I I think waiting to see what happens is probably what we're trying to make sure people uh, don't do because that's not going that has never worked in the past and it's not going to work next spring either very good thank you that's it for this week's episode of the dairy edge podcast and my thanks to joe Patton for joining me on this week's show don't forget to rate review and subscribe to the podcast you can listen on apple spotify or wherever you get your podcasts And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm James Dunn, and join us next time for your Dairy Edge.